Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Kla. I'm a, a senior lecturer in software engineering at Monash University, and I am also an MSR junior PC co-chair. So it is uh, today, uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor John Grandy, who will uh, give a seminar about the uh, tips for SE paper reviewers. So uh, with some hope that it will be useful for everyone. Yep, over to you now. Thank you, John. Hey, thanks, Kai. Hi, everybody. Thanks for the opportunity to have a chat with you. Um, so very briefly, I'll, I want to take a very different view to what Tim took. So I want to particularly focus on the kind of mindset or attitude um, of when you're doing reviews. This is kind of in general, probably even more generally than just reviewing software engineering um, papers. Um, so first of all, the acknowledgement of countries. So um, I'm going to... Um, acknowledge the um, the traditional owners of the land that I'm meeting on from here at Monash Clayton campus. So as we gather for this meeting, physically dispersed and virtually constructed, let us take a moment to reflect the meaning of place, doing so recognize various traditional lands in which we do our business today. Uh, we acknowledge the elders, past, present, emerging of all the land we work and live on, their ancestral spirits with gratitude and with respect. So I'm in the land of the Kulin nations or the traditional owners of the land here at Monash, um, and that's where I'm meeting from you today. I uh, pay my respects to all the First Nations peoples all around the world from where different ones of you might be meeting uh, for, 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 from today. All right, I'll just give you a very quick rundown. I had a look at my CV, because um, I was curious, um, one, how many papers have I refereed, but also how much refereeing have I caused the community? Because when I submit papers, um, someone has to referee it. So I figured out I've got exactly 550 refereed papers published or accepted at the moment. So if you multiply that by three, now some papers are reviewed by two, some by four in strange circumstances, but that's about 1,500 reviews people have done on those published papers. And I've got another couple of dozen or so under review in various stages of revision. Um, but <laughs> those are the accepted ones. So also I've got my share of rejections or... Um, um, however you want to describe it. So I'm, I'm actually guesstimating this one, um, but it must be around that number. So I don't put on my CV how many I've been rejected, but um, it's about that. So there's about 900 papers in total I've submitted. Some of those 550 have been recycled a couple of times. They got rejected once or twice and so on. Um, it's probably about something in the order of, you know, two and a half to 3,000 reviews that people have done on my work today. Um, I also got a bunch of grants. Each of those are reviewed. And in fact, I've probably submitted double the number of grants that I've got accepted over the years. Maybe that's even an underestimate. And so those tend to get actually a few more reviews than papers do. So there's at least four, maybe even 500 reviews that I've caused people to have to do on my grants as well. Um, I didn't do it all by myself. So I've got a whole bunch of students and postdocs and so on. I've been very fortunate um, to work with over the years and still work with now. Um, and I thought, I'll, I'll, given, given that's what I, the reviewing load I've called me and my students have caused the community, um, what have I given back? Well, I, I actually write, I put down on my CV, and I have done ever since I started reviewing academic papers, which venue I reviewed for and how many. So I was actually going to go and count up. <laughs> now, slightly inaccurately, because I couldn't be bothered doing it precisely, but it's, a, it's close to 14 hundred papers I've reviewed, give or take, say, 10 or 20, since 1991 when I did my first review. Um, and um, I've, also, I've also reviewed over a thousand grants because I've been on the national grant panel for many years, um, both in New Zealand and Australia. So I've done about maybe, say, close to two and a half thousand reviews of grants and, and papers. Um, now, no, with these papers up here, I've got co-authors, so I don't have to you know, do three times as many reviews of them to owe the community back kind of thing. Um, the co-authors can do some uh, as well. And anyway, I thought you'd find that a little bit interesting. Um, so Tim talked about um, Reviewer 2. Um, it's a great talk title, but first of all, I'd like to ask, well, why, why have we kind of, um, if you like, um, put Reviewer 2 in that kind of category? Why do we think so negatively of them? How do they get such a bad rap? Um, what should those reviewers or reviewers in general be doing differently so we don't think of them this way? And maybe more importantly, what should we be doing 
differently so we don't end up getting labeled um, reviewer two, even if we are reviewer number two on a paper. Um, I also wanted to sort of think a little bit about like why are we reviewing anyway? Um, um, I, I, I'll just float, I don't think I talk much about this, but why is it community service versus paid work? I think it's an interesting question because it's a lot of work. Um, if I divide that, what was it, a uh, number I gave you, um, two and a half thousand paper and grant reviews I've done by the 30 years I've been an academic, that's um, an awful lot. <laughs> Each year that I do, um, that's an awful lot of work, um, and um, I, I, I don't get paid for that typically. Um, and how do we make sure we do a good job? Um, and not not just on reviewing um, papers, but grants, doing PhD examinations, and maybe doing other kind of reviewing of, of, of information that we sometimes do. Um, so why why are we bothering with these kind of um, these kind of um, talks at the moment? Well, there's a perception um, that, that software engineering and maybe more generally scientific um, paper reviewing, uh, peer reviewing systems broken. And it may or may not be true, or may may or may not be true to a large extent or a lower extent. Um, and there's a number of factors that might might um, influence that. You know, this kind of publish or perish mentality low acceptance rates, um, anti-pattern reviewing, and I'll come back to that, of course. Um, and maybe there's a perception, and maybe it's a partial reality, that some or maybe even many software engineering reviewers are unfair, biased, do a slack job, do an overly pedantic job where you get like a 10-paper review for a 10-page paper. Um, they're subjective versus objective, uh, irresponsible, untrustworthy, and even uh, committing some levels of um, research or review misconduct. Um, now, these things might be true some of the time, um, and let's ultimately try and not be one of them. Um, and probably many of you on this um, Zoom have kind of been subjected to one or more of those kind of um, issues uh, already, unfortunately. Um, and again, reviewer two really has become the kind of meme or kind of representation, if you like, um, of that problem um, to date. So I want to think about what, why do we peer review? Um, and um, some reasons, and maybe some reasons, but not that really shouldn't be reasons. Um, well, basically, it's a gatekeeping exercise, of course. We just published everything. If people just put their paper in their GitHub repository or off their homepage or on some free-for-all um, site, um, then you know, we wouldn't peer review in the way that we do now. And whether we should or even shouldn't do this is probably a discussion for another day. Um, and a pretty interesting one, too, by the way. Um, Typically, though, what we're doing is we are gatekeeping by applying some kind of quality measures, and I put quality in inverted quotes. Um, and really, it's 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 closely related to the gatekeeping. If we weren't gatekeeping, would we be bothering with that, or would we be doing it in a different way? I've recently actually reviewed for a couple of um, digital health journals where, first of all, the reviewers' names are published with the paper and you get back the reviewers' names. You know, there's no, no double blind review. You, they know who you are, you know who they are. Um, and their referee, um, their reports, um, their reviews are published with the published paper and your responses to their reviews are published with the published paper. So anyone who's reading the paper can also see what the reviewers originally thought of it, how you responded to that, um, and the changes you made, how the reviewers then responded to your changes, and ultimately then the resultant um, paper, which is uh, pretty different uh, uh, to how um, we do things in software engineering at the moment. I found it pretty interesting, actually, and pretty refreshing in some ways. And there's a certain level of maturity that comes from that reviewing that, that I don't think we quite have yet in our discipline. Anyway. Um, and then, of course, the other thing is, you know, you want scientifically knowledgeable peers, that's why it's peer review, to give constructive feedback to authors to help improve the reporting and maybe even the conducting of their, their research. You know, if there's some research 
methodology flaws. You may give feedback to the to the authors so they can you know, redo their experiments or even redo their whole um, research study. Um, now, it, it sometimes is used and shouldn't be used for some other things. So artificially low acceptance rates, because if your acceptance rate is lower, surely your venue must be better and then more people will want to submit to it, blah, blah, blah. Um, we only want work with positive outcomes. Anything with a negative result or inconclusive result, no, nah, can't go. That's kind of a, a form of publication bias. And traditionally, you know, I've, I've had a number of papers where I've submitted and we've either had inconclusive results or even downright negative results. It seemed like a good idea at the time, but the user study or the, um, the analysis showed it wasn't so good. Um, referees just said, well, this is there's a negative result. We don't want to, we're not interested in this. Don't, don't, um, don't publish it. Now it's changed a little bit recently. I've had a few negative result papers published the last few years. Um, we've now got things like the kind of registered report type ideas where you can get validated your study design and then assuming you write up the results in a sensible kind of way, um, get the results published, whatever, whether good, bad, and different or whatever. Um, but again, that's a relatively new thing in software engineering. And so for most of the time, you'd hide the negative or inconclusive results in your paper uh, explicitly or implicitly. Um, you know, maybe it's to um, make sure that work only conforms to our current orthodoxy or there is the opposite of that, you know, kind of quash, unfashionable, unpopular, different, or um, even work that, you know, when you're reviewing, hey, that Grundy 2006 is the worst way to do blah, blah. Hey, I'm not going to allow that kind of thing to be published. It's it's kind of downgrading my work or something like that. So it's got to be rejected. Um, maybe it's generating revenues for publishers. So we are um, got to pay big page charges. Um got to pay subscriptions to access that kind of gate-kept knowledge repository. And even if the work's really great, if you don't pay this money one way or another, it ain't appearing. Um, then, of course, the, uh, the last one, which I'll come back to a few more anti-patterns related to, um, maybe it's so that we can hide behind anonymity and say whatever we like, get back at people and knock over them, their work, um, et cetera. Um, one would hope that's not the purpose of peer reviewing. Occasionally when you read a review though, you might feel uh, that might be something that's going on. Um, so I thought I'd share some thoughts of you um, about um, responsibilities and then um, some ways that I try and think about um, reviewing my peers' work myself and some things I try and avoid doing um, myself. Um, so first of all, um, I, I, one of the reasons I wanted to sort of tell you the amount of reviewing I've done over the years, it takes a lot of time and you can only do so much. So I say no um, quite a bit of the time. I get a lot of invitations to review things and I, I accept some and I decline others. Um, I decline all of the ones from kind of dodgy venues, which I get lots of them. And by that, I mean, you know, because you kind of write only open access things where you pay a big author page charge and nobody reads and cites the work and so on. So any of those kind of things I don't I don't referee for. Um, I typically these days only referee for venues that um, I feel I'm you know, I'm working in, I've got a lot of expertise in. Uh, it's not 100% true. Every now and then there might be something I referee for that, um, you know, traditional I've refereed for. I might not have worked in the area for a little while, but I, I still feel quite knowledgeable and I can give good feedback to the authors. Um, I, for example, have recently turned down um, a invitation to be on a, a top conference program committee that I've been on many times before, but uh, I'm the general chair of ICSI for next year. It's going to be a lot of work. It's already a lot of work to do that. And I just thought I'm not going to be able to devote the time to that particular uh, conference. It's a bit of a disappointment to turn down, but I thought it was more responsible and it gives an opportunity for maybe one of the people on this call to referee instead of me. Um, but then you shouldn't turn down every invitation, I think. I'll maybe come back to that um, briefly again. Um, you know, there's been a lot of people who have peer-reviewed my work, and I feel I've got a responsibility to the community to, to do my share. Now, again, I have a lot of co-authors, students, postdocs, junior colleagues I can recommend and so on. Um, so if I do turn down a review, I almost always try and suggest 
often junior colleagues to do reviewing. I often get my PhDs and some of my postdocs to do some reviewing. Um, and um, again, that helps to give them experience, but it also helps me to manage um, my loads. So I'm trying I try to take on reviewing that I can do uh, and do a good job of. Um, now, Tim talked a bit about this in his talk. Hopefully you managed to see that or have seen his slides. Um, I decided I wasn't going to go into that kind of detail again today. I'll take a different perspective. But um, there are a number of guidelines. Yeah, we've got the, the soundness, the, uh, the novelty, the verifiability, the presentation. You know, some of those are quite traditional. A couple of them are kind of more recent things. Um, there's some debate about some of those in the community. And again, Tim touched on this as well. Um, I kind of feel, you know, if there are reviewer instructions and there are reviewer guidelines and criteria, you should follow them. If you've agreed to be on that program committee or editorial board, um, if we all come up with our own criteria and some of us implement some and some others and so on, it makes it very difficult for the authors to... Um, First of all, understand how you're reviewing the work, but secondly, to um, get some kind of consistency. So um, even though I don't 100% always agree with a particular kind of interpretations or guidelines, I actually try and follow them as best I can um, so the authors can get some, some level of consistency from, from you know, reviewing of their, of their works. Um, now, this is partly re returning on time. So this is partly my associate editor and my PC chair head on. There's nothing more frustrating. Well, actually, there's a couple of things more frustrating, but not, not much more frustrating than people who, well, never agree to review things, agree to review things and don't return them, um, return them very late or return a very slack review, you know, very short or very imprecise or doesn't follow any agreed guidelines. And I've got to go and get someone else to referee um, that. So timeliness is really important. Um, conflict of interest, again, um, this is well defined. So you should never, ever be reviewing your supervisors wherever, for the entirety of your career. You've always got a conflict with them and, and any of your students. You, you always got a conflict with them. Others you might have worked with in recent times. And again, this might be two years, three years, four years, depending on the, the rules of the, the journal, the conference. Some of them have some slightly different ones. There's some sig soft ones. Um, if you're not familiar with them, just have a glance over. Um, if you basically feel you can't be objective um, about this work, maybe it's someone you've had a bit of a disagreement with in the past or you, you just don't like <laughs> their work, then don't review it. Um, I'll come back to that as well. Um, be respectful and constructive. So again, I'll come back to this, but, but the, the way I think of this is write reviews of the kind you'd like to receive. That's kind of a pretty good guideline. So, um, you know, adhering to criteria, um, being respectful, um, being constructive, being timely, um, enough precision, but not, a, not an essay about what the authors can do uh, are, um, are really helpful reviews. And you should be trying to be helpful. It should be a constructive exercise, not a destructive exercise. Um, it's good if you review things you've got sufficient expertise. Now, I actually think it's okay to review outside your expertise here, but be clear, you know, you have a, so often you can say your level of confidence or your level of expertise will rank yourself down if you're not so confident about your review or not so confident about your expertise in the area. And, you know, you haven't read the latest stuff in the area the last two or three years. Um, again, there may be other referees that are much more expert than you and up to date and so on, but you can still give a lot of good help around, again, explaining the experimental design, the motivation, um, the conclusions, et cetera. Um, and if issues come up, you know, um, sometimes they do. You know, you've decided to start working with this person um, and you've been assigned a paper, um, then, you know, flag that. Maybe you've got very low confidence or maybe you can't, you can't return a review in time it's much more helpful for the PC chairs or the associate editor if it's a journal paper to, to tell them sooner rather than later. And it's very appreciated if you do that. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, kind of attitude and mindset, then I'll talk about some patterns and anti-patterns specifically. Um, so again, I mentioned this review like you'd like to be reviewed. Do you really want to be a, labeled a, a reviewer too? Um, and again, you know, keep a respectful tone, 
um, be constructive with your criticisms, even if they're quite severe criticisms, um, be timely, um, try and be precise. Um, if you've got a concern with something that, you know, it might be the motivation, it might be the method, it might be some particular related work, it might be the way the results have been presented, maybe the conclusions drawn from some of the results, maybe the particular statistical test, it, it might be the, <clears throat> the sampling, it might be something else. Um, try and be specific, because um, that'll really help the authors so they can fix it up, either, either um, if it's a major revision for a journal, or if it's unfortunately a, a reject for a conference, they can do appropriate things to address it. It's um, really frustrating to get really vague um, criticisms of your work and you you can't figure out what the referee is is getting at. So I was trying to think, how can I give constructive feedback from improving this work? And sometimes it's the present, a lot of the time uh, it's presentation of the work. The work is actually good, or seems very good, but the way it's presented, and the presentation can be at the very high level, you know, why are we doing this? You know, software engineering is a practical discipline. And you know, my view is always we should be looking for ways that practitioners can, can use these results either sooner or later. Um, it might be really de really detailed um, things like making sure the, the decimal points in the place. And I've seen a couple of ones where people have made, made formatting mistakes and the results make it a complete nonsense. Um, everything else is great, but when they, they put it into the particular format that, that the journal or conference is using, the results became meaningless and they hadn't, hadn't noticed in their checking. Um, it might be, you know, explaining the uh, the importance or the the implications of the work and and so on. It might be the grammar. It might be reorganizing the paper a little bit to 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 tell the story uh, about the study. It might be all of the above. Um, if some criteria not met, um, then say so. But again, try and be precise and explain the reasoning. Uh, again, it's very frustrating to be told this is not x whatever the criteria x is and there's no you no know, details or not sufficient details or imprecise details about that but again um you, you need to to, to 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 spend the appropriate amount of time and care but you can't read every detail um i've, I've been assigned 20 something xt papers and <laughs> time's gone by and i'm not gonna be able to read every single word and every single 20 xt papers now we'll try to improve that by reducing reviewer load but it's still very difficult to do that um, particularly when I'm on grant panels, I often get a very large number of grants and there's no way I could ever read every single detail that's written in those. So I try and look for things that, that are critical. Um, some often are more critical than others. Um, and, and I'm often looking for, you know, why is this needing to be, um, needing to be published to convince myself? And, and often as I'm doing reading, I tend to find there's areas I need to drill down on. There's others I, you know, accept that, it seems to be perfectly reasonable. I don't need to read every sentence in detail to, to check it and so on. Uh, I think I've talked about criticisms and, and you know, again, um, making sure they're justified. Um, and again, um, one, one thing I like is precise feedback. I don't like getting really long reviews where maybe only one quarter of the view is actually helpful. There's a lot of repetition or copy and paste or just a bunch of text that like, this isn't helping me <laughs> understand the review or to fix up. So I like precision and, and sometimes less is more. So writing great big long reviews, not always that helpful, I find, particularly if there's a lot of, uh, it's, not, it's difficult for the authors to find where the, the real critical commentary is. Um, um, again, I think we've got better about negative results or, or inconclusive results in software engineering than we once were. I, I still think it's a way to go. Um, there's still a sort of positive result publication bias that creeps in. Um, but I, I like to think, you know, research is research. And we, you know, if we knew the knew what the result was going to be at the start of it, why even bother doing it? Is it even research? Um, so there must be a lot of studies where um, the results are negative or, you know, further studies need to be done and we can't give highly conclusive um, uh, findings in this particular um, study. So I think we're a bit unrealistic um, on, on a lot of the time and, and need to be a bit careful about that. Um, again, I think it's uh, human nature when you see, you know, Grundy 2006 is a terrible way to do blah, blah, has got all these limitations. Um, this is a criticism of my work. This is a criticism of me. Um, this can't be good kind of thing, but you, you have to overcome that. Um, and um, I actually these days quite like when I see my own work being criticised. Um, uh, maybe it's just my strange 
view of the world. But um, you know, it's great seeing one one that people actually read your work is nice, but also that you know, hopefully it might have inspired or um, uh, provided a motivation for some further studies. And those studies are better than mine. Um, and I actually quite like that now. Um, now, there's an interesting one. You, you'll be told, and often uh, this is common, the program committee is perhaps rather than editorial boards. Uh, they'll be like, we need to find reasons to accept, not reject. And we hear this again and again. I've heard it again and again over many years. Um, I'm, I'm not convinced that a lot of the program committee members think that way, or even some of the program chairs think that way, because often in the program committee discussion, there's a lot of reasons for reject being picked up on often. Some seem pretty minor to me, um, rather than this is really good work. It's got some limitations, always got limitations, but some of those limitations seem pretty minor, and yet we're using that as a reason to reject it. So I think people trot this one out, but um, I think we have to get ourselves in a mindset. Yeah, I'm looking for reasons to accept, and as, you know, reasons to reject have to be pretty, pretty strong, pretty significant. So I've got a few um, things I, I try and do. Um, again, I'm human like the rest of us, so um, you might be one or two of the anti-patterns do creep in, although I try and you know, some of the worst ones, <laughs> of course, not do them. And some of the patterns, sometimes I might not um, implement them as, as well as I might like, but one tries. Um, so I mentioned this one. I only take on roles I think I can do. So I've got the time, I've got the expertise, and I can be sub sub selectively objective. A couple of times I've been assigned journal papers to review and you know, I've had some issues with the work from these previous authors um, because often, usually they're not anonymous, so I know who they are. And I just feel like I don't think I can give a, as an objective as I should review of this work because of my perceptions of that team's work in the past. So I decline them. Now, I'm probably perfectly capable of doing it and make, one might even argue I, I should be able to overcome that and do it. But if I feel like there's a... I have a potential subjectivity problem with the authors or the work, um, then I, I, I take the view I decline. There'll be someone else who's in a better state of mind, if you like, to do it. Um, again, there's only a certain amount of time I can devote to reviewing. So uh, at the moment, by the way, I'm saying no to everything, <laughs> um, except a revision, which I, which I think I've got a couple of those to finish up. But at this time of year, I'm going to be away until early January, very soon. I'm not going to be able to review anything and get it back in a time amount. I'm just saying no. I'll suggest other reviewers who may be available. Um, I like to delegate some to postdocs and PhDs, uh, particularly when I'm being associate editor. Um, I tend not to give them conference papers. I tend, when I when I agree to be on a conference program committee, my, my personal view is it's me that they've been invited, not my PhDs. Um, if I've got a PhD working in an area of a paper, I might ask them, can you have a look at this and tell me what you think? But I will write typically the details of the review. Occasionally, if they're a real expert, I might get them to write a draft of part. But I'll, I'll do other reviewing of the paper, often some of the sort of higher level aspects, and I'll definitely write that myself. When I go to the program committee, it's up to me to defend that review if I've got a disagreement with other program committee members. So I have to be very confident about that. Okay, a couple of times I've asked PhD to write a review of a paper and so I disagreed <laughs> with theirs. Um, so I wrote my own. Um, and um because I have to I have to defend that. Um, um but I think it's good to um uh, to get junior people um, involved early on in their careers and reviewing and um you know someone's given them some help about the level of detail, the particular things to focus on and, and so on. I don't think we do that enough as a community. So this, this kind of junior PC idea is actually a refreshing okay, change. I was just dumped in the deep end. I, my first few conferences, I was just put on the program committee, given a whole pile of papers. There was no, we didn't bother with um, criteria much in those days. Um, and, you know, you really were, um, you know, you, you had very little, and there's no, no kind of big, long reviewer guideline kind of things. Um, so I think a lot of the reviewing in times gone by has been pretty dodgy. Um, Again, I, I like to try and think, how would I like to review? Even if I've got, even I think this work has got severe problems, how can I write a review that's going to be constructive, um, but, but clear that this work can't be accepted, for example? Here's some serious issues. Um, be polite. 
even if it's I've spent a whole lot of time reading this thing, and I'm like, why did they do this? I'm really frustrated. Um, and again, again, enough enough detail, enough precision, enough precise detail that will help those authors and then um, either fixing up this work or in, in the next work they're doing. Um, again, I try to be clear and constructive. Don't always maybe achieve as much as I I can, but I try. Um, what what needs to be done to modify the the approach that's used in the study? The the results discussion, the analysis, the presentation, illustration of the work, motivating examples, implications of practice and research, et cetera. Um, it'll strengthen this work. And sometimes it, I might be very positive about the paper and I want it accepted, but there's one of those things that I still think needs significant improvement in the camera ready. Um, and I'll sometimes actually write quite a, quite a detailed review of a paper I'm very positive on because I think it could still be made better um, when the authors do their camera ready uh, preparation and so on um, and I try and be praiseworthy when I can um, and um, clear and concise and, and polite um, as well um, again I, I like to try and encourage you know even if this paper's got really serious problems and there's no way we could contemplate accepting this there's no hope for revising it if it's a journal etc um, try and encourage them to come back to the venue and try and encourage them to keep working um, in this area. I, I do review a lot of papers um, from people that are new to software engineering or new to publishing in a particular software engineering venue. Um, and, you know, when I started off in software engineering, there was, there was quite a perception that it was a clique. You know, if you were friends with X, Y, and Z people in the community, you know, you'd get good reviews of your paper and so on. And there's everybody else that community weren't that interested in and the reviews to be honest I think showed that um, I even got a review once back um, actually I think it was an XE review that says something like this is pretty interesting work but yeah we don't know these people <laughs> um, and um, no, I'm not confident they can do this this and this change it probably should be rejected and it was and um, it kind of made me feel you know this is a community I really want to work in um, again I think we've improved over the years but um, we, we need to uh continuing continue to be welcoming to, to people who may not be familiar with the way we write papers at a particular venue or um uh, even the community as a whole and um be careful in our feedback to them we don't seem like we're some kind of clique and putting up shutters against people and ideas that we don't like don't don't don't, don't welcome um now i make mistakes as i mentioned before as i'm human so occasionally occasionally hopefully things creep in so um author rebuttal i actually quite like them and I, I actually have had now let me think in the last three or four years i've had two XE papers we've got up that had like you know two minor reject kind of things in a week except and so so we managed to persuade <laughs> i've had um i think we got an fsc one up that was similar um I might have got an ASC one up that was similar as well, but the ASC one I think went through some kind of shepherding kind of um, updating process before it was finally accepted. Um, so I actually am a believer in the rebuttal. I think you can change the referee's um, view. I have changed my review quite a number of times based on the author rebuttal where, oh yeah, I may, I might have missed that. Um, didn't realize the significance that okay I accept they're they're going to change these things in the camera ready to make sure that they're not over claiming or they're you know they're making this more precise focus of the findings and implications and so on yeah they're going to do those changes that I think are really important I'll, I'll trust the authors to do that um and so um yeah I get I'm, I'm one reviewer that um has changed a number of times now this is quite a number of times I haven't but um I do think the rebuttal is effective and useful, and I would encourage you as a reviewer um, to um, very carefully take the rebuttal into account and change your review and score if, if you deem it necessary. Um, again, a, a bit like the other timely things, you know, we, we often need to discuss um, things, so being timely, detailed, again, polite to other reviewers uh, is really important. As well, I've been involved in a couple of very unpleasant program committee meetings and a couple of very unpleasant online program committee meetings where the, where the, where the referees have attacked on the same paper have attacked each other. <laughs> um, one of them is um, really terrible exercise um, where I got brought in as the fourth referee to try and moderate it, and it was unmoderatable. Um, 
And the, the, the authors don't need that kind of nonsense going on. And then, look, I have a view. Um, if I'm on the border or the, 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 uh, if I'm the associate editor and you know, we've got two accepts and a reject, um, and ultimately the reject's never going to be made happy, but there's no fundamental flaws. They just disagree with things around its importance or focus or whatever. Um, I think publish it and let the community decide. They'll decide by citations, good or bad. <laughs> so um, if it's on the borderline, my view is, why don't we just publish it? And um, you know, as long as there's no serious um, flaws with the work. Um, and then again, as an associate editor for trans on software engineering, there's quite a number of accepts where I was the AE and one of those referees was a reject referee. The other two were accept. And I, I made the recommendation to the editor in chief, well, let's just accept it and publish. I think, I think pretty much on every occasion that was done. I think we should do a bit more at conferences as well. Uh, you know, what's, what's really the risk? Um, now, it's things I try not to do, by the things I don't do. Um, to clear all my conflicts of interest, um, and um, yeah, I think I'll just review this anyway. Um, um, so um, um, it might even be a friend of mine, and yeah, we yeah we published together recently, but no one will know. Um, and uh, away we go. So um, I have a view. Yeah, if you're in any doubt, if you don't think you can do an objective review, or if you're in doubt about whether you've got a conflict of interest, just say no. Don't don't take it on. Reject. There will be someone else who can do it. Um, Reject all my requests for you. I accept a lot of them. I probably accept maybe a little bit too many because uh, I actually enjoy reviewing. I really enjoy reading other people's emerging. I actually enjoy giving feedback, even if it's quite harsh, although I try and not do it harsh, but you know, a lot of constructive feedback. I enjoy doing that. It's something about the job I really like and I've always liked. Um, I, I'm trying to remember if I've ever been late with a review. Now I, I might be pushing this. I'm going to make the claim and Who's, who's online, I don't know, but uh, I don't believe, pers I personally have ever been late with a review. Now, there might be one counter or two counter examples in the last 30 years, but I, I manage my time so that I either get all my reviews in on time or I tell the program chairs or the editor, sorry, I'm just not going to be able to do this and, and someone else needs to do it. Uh, and I've never not returned a review, ever. Um, I've always returned reviews on time that I've promised. I don't try and manage my time, so always make sure that's the case. Um, I don't look for ways to um, reject work because, you know, I disagree with it um, or it criticizes my work or, look, I just don't feel this works any good. It doesn't I feel, you know, it kind of just doesn't feel right to me, so it's got to go. Um, I could do a better job of this work um, or it's better than my work and makes me look bad. Uh, um, I don't make up my own reviewing criteria on the fly um, and use it for this style of work. So the, these days we have, for most conferences and some journals, pretty well-defined things you look for uh, and that you should be scoring and evaluating for. And um, you know, making up your own is, makes life really difficult for the poor authors. Um, Classic ones, rejection. Again, Tim touched on some of these, but they, they, they're really frustrating. And you, some of you may have experienced these yourselves. There's been number four. <laughs> well, okay, give me the reference, please. Um, I think that's just an unacceptable. Um, I think I've seen a paper like this five years ago. I remember getting on one of my reviews. Like, well, okay, well, which one is it then? Because we can't find it. And uh, I think that's really unacceptable. Um, if, if it's been done before, then give us the reference or references. Um, otherwise, don't say that and don't score it that way. It's not interesting, results obvious, doesn't improve, blah, blah. Again, you know, you have to have some precision around these things. Why does it improve the state of the art? Tim talked about, you know, some, um, some good ways of kind of uh, doing that for sort of quite quantitative types of work. There's also a lot of other qualitative types of work you can and compare it to. And sometimes, you know, we've done a replication study or we've done a study similar to this one. We found similar results. It's actually still a useful contribution. Um, and um, obvious results, they're only obvious sometimes when you, they're presented from a well-crafted and written up study. <laughs> um, and they might never been documented before. Really short reviews. Um, I've had, I've had one-line reviews. I've actually had one-line reviews from supposedly quite good conferences. Um, and those are yeah, not worth the characters they're tight with. Um, 
I don't write reviews without reading anything at all in the paper, and I'm pretty sure I've had a few reviews over the years. Um, like this review in my paper don't look anything like each other. It's clearly they've reviewed either something else or they haven't read a single word of what we've written. Um, I don't, um, you know, write nice things and then get papers accepted that have got serious problems of mates of mine. Um, and yeah, I know they'll fix it up or, you know, they'll owe me a favor because I'll tell them at the next conference I did that for them, blah, blah, blah. Um, I don't reject things and then use them in my own work. You know, again, when you take on reviewing, um, it's in secret, right? So, so in, in confidence and um, you must never uh, misuse that and, and, and try and draw from those works um, into your own. It's a very naughty um, thing to do. I don't bully junior reviewers. I'm, I'm kind of, I guess, quite a senior one these days. I've had a lot of experience, but um, if if the junior reviewers and I are disagreeing, usually I think the junior reviewers are right, to be honest, probably they are. Um, and, and again, keep the online discussions polite. I, I'm, I'm open to changing my viewpoint. Um, if I've made a mistake or not quite realized something um, or a different interpretation can be taken, and that's quite reasonable. Um, I don't be nice to friends. Uh, um, so they'll do it to me. Um, don't like this person. You know any characteristics? They'll pick your characteristics, um, or you know it's just a bad day. Um, so this has got to be um, rejected. And I've, you know, occasionally I feel I've got rejections from submissions that some of these are. Uh, I have the suspicion that something one of those is unfortunately Krypton. So I don't do that. Now, um, one day. You're going to be a program committee chair, associate editor, editor in chief. And a lot of these kind of issues come up in a sort of a higher level, uh, the meta level, if you like. So, some good things, you know, um, when you're an associate editor or um, the program committee chair, um, you know, using good reviewers. If you've got some anti patent reviewers, don't use them. Um, ideally, some consequences will befall those people, but um, it, it, the system is such that it's sometimes a bit difficult to engineer. Um, make sure the referees have got some good experience and expertise and reliability. Um, again, as an author, it's so frustrating to get reviews back very, very, very late, or not at all. Um, chase up people. I seem to spend a lot of my life doing that these days, so it's okay. Um, and again, sometimes authors are concerned about reviews, and um, I think a good kind of mindset is treat them like you'd like your concerns. Treated. So um, if, if, if authors come back with a concern or want to query something about a review, don't just ignore it. Um, you know, treat it as a serious issue and, and treat it as you'd like your own concerns to be treated. Um, if there's a really bad review, anti patent review of some sort, um, look, get removed. I've removed the number of reviews um, when I've been associate editor or I've got an extra program committee member to review if I'm a program committee member because the other one was just unfair or not sufficient quality to make a judgment on. And look, um, you know, you start to figure out there's a few bad eggs in every community, hopefully not too many in software engineering. Um, don't use them for editorial boards. Don't use them on program committees. Um, things not to do, <laughs> pick all your friends to be on it. And again, people that are like you, pick, your, pick whatever characteristics. So we end up with um, all kinds of unrepresentative um, collections of people running things. Um, assign people, you know, you, there's sometimes some harsh reviewers or some killer offer reviewers, don't, don't use them, don't do that to people. Uh, and again, I occasionally feel I've got a few reviews like that. Um, don't be super late assigning things or not assigning at all. I actually had a paper that was submitted, a very good journal. It sat there for over a year um, before a new, a new editor-in-chief was appointed. <laughs> you know, there's your you got any feedback on this paper yet? And it turned out that it had been not assigned for review for over a year. Um, so let's not have things like that, please. Um, I think I think it's just that everything needs three except, and they've got to be clear except. And so no matter what is, is a mistake, and a number of really good works have been unfairly treated by... Not, not all of us have to agree all the time. And so long as there's no really clear fundamental problems with the work, um, it's okay to have some disagreement among the reviewers. and. One of the jobs of the associate editor or the program committee chairs is to sometimes make a call that, okay, the majority think this should be published, we should go with that. 
Um, one of the things I find frustrating is I, I go and get a, I do a major revision, submit it, and then they give another reviewer this thing, or even some two two new reviewers, and I get a whole heap of new feedbacks. So they're often using different criteria than the previous ones. Um, and yeah, look, um, I, I do actually, when I'm associate editor, sometimes assign a paper to a new referee because because the others aren't available or something. Or there's, there's a concern. And as someone with expertise, I'd really value their judgment. But you have to be very careful. It's very unfair on the authors, I feel, to, again, essentially keep on giving them new criteria every time. Um, no paper is going to ever make it through that. Um, and again, if there's problems with the reviews, don't ignore the authors. Um, have a dialogue with them and you know handle, handle complaints. I've had to handle complaints a few times, not very often. But again, it's um, you know, some of these things are make or break things for people's people's careers and career progression. They've got to treat them serious. Um, so look, um, it's part of your job to do peer review, at least in the system that we currently have. Um, should be done at a professional level. Um, I think do your share, but not more than your share. Don't take on too much for your own personal well-being, but also the community's well-being. And, and you know, don't just do none, um, very little. Um, it's an important service contribution. It would be actually be nice to be paid for it, in my view, but, but anyway, it's another talk for another day. Um, typically, these days, there's good guidelines, and um, you know, we'd like you to do it in a timely manner, quality. Um, look for reasons to accept. Be constructive. You know, justify your criticisms. You know, the, the authors deserve, if you've got a problem with something they're saying, you're clear about what that is. And always observe the conflict of interest um, rules. If in doubt, just don't review it. Um, don't take on too much. Don't return it late or not return. Provunctory, no justification. Kill off things because you think it's um, you want to get back at someone who didn't talk to you nice at the last MSR conference or something. Um, breach confidentiality. You don't talk outside the refereeing room, um, the, the ones that are on the paper or the program committee, et cetera. Don't steal the ideas. Um, don't review people that you never should be reviewing. Um, don't submit fake reviews um, for you or your friend's work, etc. And one day you'll be in charge of forming um, these um, program committees and editorial boards, and it'll be your job to, to be assigning um, the works just like you're being assigned ones for the, for the junior review panel. Um, thanks very much. Thank you so much, John. Uh, I think uh, these are very good advice. <clears throat> I just want to say that uh, some of these, like I, I had uh, before, like uh, like I had one submission, which is like a, a review from the other paper. And then I don't know what, what is that, right? And yeah, if we can create a movie of this, it will be very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be fun. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> So we, I'm going to walk through uh, to the questions uh, in the Zoom chat uh, one by one. I will not uh, say the name just to protect the identity and privacy. So maybe the first question. Uh, so I think reviewers should have lots of uh, experience. I, I assume that uh, you mean uh, senior reviewers uh, of doing research and uh, review papers, right? And then why do we need uh, to encourage PhD students to uh review the papers as well yeah what is your view on that that's the purpose um, of uh, having the junior pc <laughs> well look if you're ne never given a chance to review then you'll you know we, we can't have everyone be a right. 20, 20 30 year review so we, you have to start somewhere and right, right. You know, it can I be think... it can be staged so um i think this is a nice initiative um traditionally i will have given our junior students and postdocs things to review and and done it that way um this is how i got dumped in like um i think my first xcpc was a long time ago but i you know we didn't have any reviewing well almost no reviewing criteria um you said okay you want XC? here's 27 papers to review uh, for XC, um which i think was the number i had that year um and do it in the next few weeks and um by the way there's no guidelines and no and then we're going to have an in-person committee which was very hostile i found um i got into an argument with a couple of very senior people in the community that didn't like my review they're different to theirs and yeah essentially they tried to bully me to to change my reviews to to 
one of them was accept one of their friends' papers that they really liked, but it was ter had terrible problems. And the other one was to reject a paper that was really good, <laughs> in my view, because um, they didn't like this person. Uh, and they actually told me that um, over the over the tea break. You know, I don't like this person or their work. It should be rejected. I want you to change your review. Uh, anyway, so hopefully those days are gone. But um, um, yeah, a bit of fun. Yeah, <laughs> I see. Yeah. So I think, yeah, I, I think... Uh... Review is a uh, is a skill. It is a uh, we we need some practice. Uh, it's not something like we can do like in one day, right? So, uh, like more practice from the junior PhD student, and then develop skills, and then one day they will become a professional uh, reviewer. Uh, so yeah, I think that's very important. Yep. So uh, next one, as a PhD student, I appreciate the opportunity to prepare a draft revision and uh, contrast later with the final version uh, of my sub, uh, advisor. So we have an opportunity to learn the process. Yes, I think this is right. Yeah. It's good. Yeah, right. That's correct. Any tips uh, for not taking the peer review results personally? Oh, yeah. What do you think? That's uh, well, look. Um... <laughs> <laughs> it's really hard as, as you know, it's a human nature if someone criticizes your work we almost automatically think it's a criticize a criticism of ourselves personally and and some people are more yeah there's a personality some personality differences and i can't remember that's open to experience or conscious yeah you know, it's one of those ones anyway if you're on a certain part of the scale you're much more sensitive to criticism than others like i i think i'm i've got a you know a reasonable degree of sensitivity myself. However, um, as I showed you on that early slide, I've had so many rejections over the years. Um, you know, another rejection is like it's just part. Of, this is a normal day for me to get a rejection. Um, so, um, so that's that's kind of one one way of looking at it. But I find it hard for people to get in. You know, if you're a PhD student, your very first paper is rejected. Um, it's I've I've had a couple crying in my office. It's been crushed them. I've had a couple that decided they couldn't stay in academia because I couldn't take criticism. And I think this is actually a real issue if you can't take that criticism as, you know, it's criticism of the work or the presentation of the work, not you, it's probably the wrong thing to be working in. Um, and if you can't gain that kind of, I don't, I don't think thick skin is quite the right way of doing it, but um, you have to be able to disconnect that from Criticism of you as a person, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. It's tricky, and I think there are a number of sort of human factors that come into that. Right, yeah, I agree, yeah. Yep, uh, next one. Uh, so reviews uh, should be, uh, no, sorry, reviews that are written by PhD students should not be the final version of the reviews, but uh, uh, that will give to, to the authors, right? So I think it depends on the quality, yeah. Yeah, doing so quality. So I've had I've had PhD students who are perfectly capable of writing reviews, probably better than mine. Um, yeah. um, but um, sometimes if it's yeah, they're very inexperienced. Um, I, I certainly like to give feedback, and sometimes it's like how much detail do I should write? What should I what should I focus on? Um, you know, some people are more critical <laughs> than others in the way they phrase. You know, remember that phrasing I talked about? I think Ian, yeah, with the, back to that previous thing, getting these kind of harsh sounding reviews it's much more likely you'll take them more personally and 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 some people will just don't listen to them because <laughs> right. it's harsh um so there's kind of there's a i think there's a kind of constructive tone and, and and as class said you know it's a learned you don't just pick up a book refereeing 101 or refereeing for dummies or something and you become a great at it it's a practice thing um and um Again, so sometimes it's better you know some i don't i don't referee late in the day i referee in the morning because that's when i'm at my best and so I, 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 I referee grants, examine PhD theses, referee papers in the morning when I'm, I feel I, I feel I'm better at writing kind of nicer, if you like, and more constructive. Later in the day when I'm a bit tired and so on, I think I, I fall into the habit of writing a little bit more too harshly. So, so again, that's just a personal thing I've learned over the years that the certain times of day I'm better at review, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a better reviewer than other times of day. Yeah, right. Yeah. So next one. Yep. Uh, we have a comment. Exactly. Some reviewers reject without giving sufficient feedback or even because they don't have enough expertise to understand the research provide. So it is easier option uh, for them. Yes, I agree. I think uh, most of the reviewers. No, I, I should not say more. Some uh, just reject. Yeah. Uh, grammar is incorrect. Yeah. Oh, dear. that's not what we should do. Right. Yeah. yeah so don't. Yeah. 
Don't yes. do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and another uh, question, Professor Menzies mentioned that you are the best person to listen uh, to with respect to dex rejection or whatnot uh, to accept in general. That brings me to my dilemma, why I am here to give the benefit of doubt uh, to the authors and weak accept papers than reject them. In close decisions, what is the trigger that leads one towards making the final decision on close calls, rather how to get around the weak accept and weak reject debate. Look, so again, if you've got two weak accepts and a weak reject, why don't we accept it? Yeah. <laughs> unless, unless the weak reject is actually more strong. Now, remember these, um, these are Likert scale things, so you can't like it's a one, two, three, four, and we average them and it's a 2.5, you know, there's a degree of, you know, Clara and I might both be weak accepts, but his weak accept is a lot stronger than my weak accept. Uh, so, you know, those are just a tag and you have to look into the things discussed. And there might be a fun, Clara might be a weak accept, uh, quite, you know, but he's quite positive, but he's got a fundamental issue with, say, part of the study design that when we look closely at that, you know, this has got some severe issues, you know, maybe they're willing to go away redo that larger larger data set different statistical tests different sample population of users they're surveying or whatever they're doing um because when we start looking at that particular problem he's flagged even though he's a weak accept and he's probably the strongest sounding kind of accept there's a fundamental problem conversely i might be a weak reject but ultimately you know most of my weak reject things could be fixed you know there might be presentation issues a little bit of organization issues you know talk about this, this, and this related work, but ultimately it's still good. Um, you know, you know, explain this a little bit more. So I'm, and when you go through that, you think, you know, it's there's nothing fundamentally wrong with this. Um, there's no reason not to accept that. Um, there are a number of justified kind of things, but they could probably fix that up in the camera really without any, any great issue. Um, so I think, you know, you've got to be careful not making these kind of, you know, um, judgments based on the tagging and, and, and so on. And, um, if it gets down to the wire, as I say, my personal view is if you can't quite decide if it's just above or just, but why don't you just go above? You know, does it matter that we publish an extra paper that may have some, um, you know, some limitations? So long as it's not got serious, you know, kind of methodological or, mm. you know, kind of um, presentation or uh, other issues that, 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 you know, really clear problems with the work. Right, right. I, I agree. I think when someone want to reject a paper, they should have a valid reason that uh, this actually like uh, there is something wrong in the paper. Otherwise, like uh, yeah, just rejecting a paper because of the grammar mistake is not reasonable at all. Yeah. Okay. So um, uh, there are a few more feedback as well. Thanks a lot, John. Very timely and in, in, insightful talk. Uh, great talk, John. I especially like the points you made about the attitude keeping an open mind and finding reasons to accept that reject. Yes, I agree. Yeah, insightfully talk. Thanks very much. Yeah. Thank you so much, John. Yeah, for this really useful talk. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot, John. Yeah. <laughs> I think we, we learn a lot as a junior PC and uh, as a junior PC co-chair as well. Yeah, this is very useful. And I hope that uh, uh, what you have uh, present today, it will trigger some change uh, to the community in a better way. Yeah. All the best. Thanks so much, folks, the opportunity. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. Yep. Yeah. bye-bye. Thanks, John. Bye.